On the spoke of the universe spins the great wheel of the world, Sigil, the center of all things, where all possibilities are present. A looping, ever-shifting maze of a city, the city of doors. All places lead to Sigil if only one knows the way. Sigil is at the center of all things, touching all planes, but belonging to none, unless you count the Outlands as one of the outer planes. Sigil is one of the elements of D&D that hooked me, and it continues to, along with the Outer Planes and the Planescape cosmology in general. Perhaps thinly veiled and obvious on the surface, the D&D universe turns out to be an immensely rich and complex world of ideas and only gets deeper the further in you go. The map of the multiverse is nearly a map of philosophy itself. On the edges, you have the basics. Order, chaos, good, evil. Ideas manifested as physical planes of existence. As you come toward the center, these alignments interact, forming more complex ideas. Somewhere in here is the prime material plane, where most humans live. And at the center of the map lie the questions about the nature of reality that the factions of Sigil are asking. There's actually a realm outside all of this, the Great Beyond, or Far Realm, incomprehensible and impossible, where even the gods may not tread. The ruler of Sigil is known as the Lady of Pain, a mysterious and enormously powerful entity. Gods aren't allowed in Sigil. She keeps them out. She doesn't actually do much of the day-to-day -day ruling of Sigil, though. In D&D, creatures have moral alignments, which the cosmology of D&D reflects. Devils from one of the nine hells of Bator are lawful evil. Demons from the Abyss are chaotic evil. Modrons from Mechanus are lawful neutral, and so on. The Lady of Pain is true neutral. She only intervenes on matters that might affect the balance of Sigil or the multiverse itself. Because of her indifference to things like murder and robbery, Sigil is a pretty shady city. If you do upset her, she has a tendency to maze people, sending them into pocket dimensions they'll never escape. Not only is the Lady of Pain true neutral, but her unknown origins and the rumors that she predates the universe could point to her being the embodiment of true neutrality itself. The headcanon that my D&D group ascribed to is that there is one embodiment for each pole on the moral alignment scale. Five beings, primordial entities who make the gods look like first-level adventurers, who have existed through the rise and fall of all previous universes. Though they may plot in accordance with their nature, their combined existence keeps the fabric of the multiverse in check. In one D&D module, the Lady of Pain repaired damage done to the universe by rewriting it, which caused the transition from the second edition rule set to the third edition. If you consider that canon, it's safe to say the Lady of Pain is one of the most, if not the most, powerful beings in the universe, which I think makes my D&D group's headcanon seem more legitimate. Either way, the Lady of Pain isn't really interested in governing Sigil, and somebody's got to do it. Within Sigil are 15 factions, all vying for control. Most of them serve some sort of governmental or social service. As long as they don't get in her way or do something to damage the stability of the city, the Lady of Pain leaves them be. Each of the 15 factions has their own philosophy, their own outlook on life, their own theory of reality, and each one is constantly recruiting, trying to spread their message and gain philosophical dominance. Athar. The Athar are the atheists and agnostics of the Planescape setting. In the world of D&D where gods are quite real and you can find that out for yourself, it may seem impossible to be atheist. But the Athar believe that the gods are not gods. They're just extremely powerful beings. You've got to admit, seeing as how the gods in D&D can be and have been killed, and several mortals have become gods, what does the word god really even mean in this context anyway? These gods obviously aren't untouchable creators of the universe. In fact, many of the gods derive their power from the amount of worshippers they have. Meaning, if you got an entire planet to worship a random merchant named Dave, Dave would suddenly find himself to be the god of merchants. But the Athar go further than this. The gods are frauds, and they don't deserve to be worshipped. But this is still a fantasy setting, and surely the Athar need priests. So where do they channel their divine energy from? The Great Unknown, which, translated into real life, could be space or the vastness of the universe, 
or that the Athar do believe there is some true divinity out there, but it's completely beyond the grasp of understanding, and any attempt at defining it is arrogant and doomed to failure. This equates the Athar either to atheists or deists who draw their wonder and beauty in life from space and science, rather than ancient man-made proclamations of what is good, or to agnostics, eatsists, or agnostic theists with some vague sense of spirituality with a keen respect for not overstating one's understanding of things. There's certainly room for variation, but I would argue that overall the alignment of the Athar might be something like chaotic good, perhaps neutral good. Believers of the Source The believers of the Source believe that existence is a forge which shapes all people. Life is a test, and every person has the potential to become God. When you die, you'll be reincarnated and come back to try the test again. They try to remember their past lives and study them, see where they went wrong and to do it better this time. Every moment is a lesson. This, combined with the fact that they believe in the true karma of Hinduism, where any suffering you're experiencing is self-inflicted, translates into something of a non-interventional approach when dealing with others. Some would call this quality being an asshole. However, due to the importance of an individual's life path, the believers of the source are very individualistic. Their philosophy translated into real life is something like a combination of Hinduism and Buddhism, except rather than seeking nirvana or an end to the cycle, the end goal is apotheosis. Their moral alignment would probably be chaotic neutral or true neutral. Bleak Cabal The Bleak Cabal illustrate an important real-life distinction in the variety of atheism that exists. Just like any situation where something is being viewed from the outside, an easy trap to fall into is to simplify it. There are countless categories and splinters of theism, some having more merit than others, but all too often atheism is painted with too broad a brush. Where the Athar believe that some meaning might be out there, indecipherable as it is, the bleak cabal deny that it exists whatsoever. No belief system has merit. The universe is irrational, chaotic, and purposeless. A quote that sums them up quite well is, Life's a bitch and then you die. There are physical rules to the universe, but no philosophical or metaphysical rules. Any meaning you want to attribute to life comes from you. But you can be a fragile source of meaning, as the members of the Bleak Cabal are at risk of falling into a catatonic state called the Grim Retreat, from being too melancholic and not having any higher meaning. Where the Athar try to spread their philosophy in order to wake people up from the lies they believe, the Bleak Cabal doesn't really try to recruit at all. People just join. In fact, the Bleak Cabal has at least a little in common with Judaism, as they actually try to dissuade you from joining. The Bleak Cabal is the most altruistic society in Sigil. They run the insane asylum, the soup kitchens, and hospitals in Sigil. Their real-life counterpart is scientific materialism, subjectivism, absurdism, or existentialism, though with a somewhat darker attitude than existentialism necessarily entails. Their alignment is definitely chaotic good. Doomguard. The Doomguard are advocates of entropy. Things fall apart. They believe that everything ends, and they're looking forward to it. Some members of the Doom Guard see the beauty of entropy and want to help it along in a not completely destructive manner. Some of them prefer to just do nothing and let entropy run its own course. These people would be chaotic good or neutral, but most of them just want to speed along the death of the universe in whatever way they can, mostly by killing things, manufacturing weapons, and splitting governments and organizations apart. The leader of the Doom Guard is so intent on making things fall apart that she attempts to cause a rebellion in the Doom Guard itself to see if it too will fall apart. The real life equivalents of the Doom Guard are fatalists and true nihilists, and on the whole, they are chaotic evil. Dustmen. The Dustmen believe that life is suffering. Where the bleak cabal denies meaning, the Dustmen deny reality itself. They say it's an illusion. They believe that you're already dead and this is an afterlife that you're better off getting out of. They seek true death. Killing themselves won't work because they'll end up in one of the outer planes again, as those serve as afterlives for mortals. So the way they attempt to escape this cycle of false life is by becoming as lifeless as possible. Basically all the dustmen are undead. Not just literally lifeless though, but also by rejecting emotion and earthly desires. You could say they seek oblivion through nirvana. Though it's not actually oblivion. The Dustmen are a cosmistic, 
where this reality is an illusion, and beyond this false life is the true life, and true death is how to get there. The Dustmen run the Sigil Mortuary. They're pretty similar to real-life Buddhists, if a bit darker in tone. They also have strong aspects of stoicism, asceticism, pessimism, and nihilism. I would argue the denial of life as being important leads to the Dustmen being neutral evil. Faded. The Faded believe in the concept of might makes right. If you have the power to take something, then you deserve to take that thing. And if you don't have the power to keep it, then you don't deserve it. It's survival of the fittest. That description makes them sound like egotistical douchebags, which they certainly can be. They are the tax collectors of Sigil after all. But in truth, their position is more nuanced than that. There is an extremely strong current of the might makes right social Darwinism, but it's not entirely about force. It's also about determination, about being a self-made man. Wikipedia claims that their philosophy takes inspiration from Ayn Rand, and there are elements of that with egoism, but Ayn Rand is very much against the idea that might makes right. Ayn Rand argues that reason is the highest virtue, and that reason and force are opposites. So they may have some semblance of objectivism, but mostly they are egoists, social Darwinists, individualists, and anarchists. I would classify them as mostly being neutral evil or lawful evil. Fraternity of Order The Fraternity of Order have a strong belief in an underlying structure or order to the universe. In the Planescape setting, there's something known as the Rule of Threes. It's a cosmic principle that states that things happen in threes. The Fraternity of Order divide the structure of the universe into three categories. Rules, laws, and axioms. Rules are man-made, laws are gods made, and axioms are made by the very universe itself. The more you understand these structures, the more you can exploit them, the more power you have. So they believe knowledge is power. Literally. Some members of the Fraternity of Order devote their lives to uncovering the entirely mysterious and elusive axioms of existence. The Fraternity of Order serve as the judges and attorneys of Sigil. They're a difficult one to relate to real-life philosophies. Lots of religions and philosophies believe in rules provided by the universe. You could say that they're like physicists. More specifically, quantum physicists who attempt to get a first-hand look at the code the universe runs on. The Fraternity of Order seems like it would be lawful neutral. Free League The Free League is the faction that isn't a faction. They're independently minded. They're the ones that tell you to think for yourself. They aren't interested in discovering or defining the meaning of reality. Like the believers of the Source and the Faded, they're an individualistic faction. But that's about all any member of the Free League really has in common with one another. Individual freedom is their ultimate, and perhaps only, ideal. They don't even have a leader. In real life, they'd be libertarians, or individualist anarchists, or softcore anarchists. Just like the Doomguard, they're a faction whose defining beliefs kind of make you question how they even exist. For the Free League, it's where you go if you dislike the rest of the factions, but not enough to want to actively destroy them. Alignment-wise, they'd definitely be chaotic neutral. Harmonium The Harmonium's main concern is peace and stability, the greater good, order, and making sure they're the ones in charge. A member of the Harmonium would take a look at a D&D alignment chart and see no difference between lawful and good. And if you disagree with that, they'll probably kill you. The Harmonium act as Sigil's police force. They're essentially authoritarians or religious fundamentalists. They fit neatly into the lawful stupid alignment. But in all seriousness, they would claim to be lawful good, but in reality are more often lawful neutral or even lawful evil. Mercy Killers the Mercy Killers are kind of similar to the Harmonium, both fixated on law. But rather than trying to be lawful good, they're only concerned with being lawful, which probably ends up making them lawful evil. The Mercy Killers are all about justice, and nothing else. Justice and retribution are their only concern. Contradictorily, they're actually so intent on bringing justice that they see themselves as exempt from the law while in the pursuit of justice. The name Mercy Killers does not mean killing out of mercy, but killing mercy. They view mercy as opposed to justice, and that mercy is for the weak. The Mercy Killers are the jailers and executioners of Sigil. Like the Harmonium, they're definitely the authoritarians or totalitarians of the world, with a bit of vigilantism. Revolutionary League The Revolutionary League takes the ideas of the Free League a couple steps further. They don't just philosophically disagree with the other factions. They want to destroy them. 
They believe that man-made laws are inherently corrupt and ought to be obliterated. They oppose order. The members are all chaotic. Most are probably chaotic neutral, but some of them may be chaotic good or evil. Some take the angle that the only way to find any truth in this world is to destroy all the lies and see what's left after, perhaps even rebuild a better world to replace the old one. Others aren't as optimistic and just say, fuck the system, let's smash it all down. They're the hardcore, violent anarchists. The type of people that destroy perfectly good public bathrooms. Sign of one. As I mentioned before, the Planescape setting has three cosmic principles that nicely affirm the rule of threes, which is one of those cosmic principles. Another of these principles is called the center of all. It states that the center of the universe is wherever you are, whoever you are. As you can see, subjectivism is kind of baked right into the setting. There's debate in the real world over similar ideas. Is anything objective? How can you really know? I myself am not a fan of subjectivism, regardless of whether it's actually true, because it seems to be an unsustainable system that can only lead to hypocrisy and contradiction. But the sign of one take this idea of subjectivity to the highest level. They believe that belief itself shapes reality, which admittedly is a core theme in Planescape Torment. The sign of one believes that everyone is the center of their own reality. Where the believers of the source think that they can become gods, the sign of one think they are already gods, that they literally control the universe. The sign of one are all about the power of imagination, thoughts, and positive thinking. In real life, they're subjectivists, or even complete solipsists, though I think many of them would take the softer approach of egocentric presentism. But solipsism doesn't necessarily say that you have control over your reality, just that the only thing your reality is comprised of is you. So the sign of one are also similar to those people who seriously believe in the law of attraction. They're probably true neutral or chaotic neutral. Society of Sensation The Society of Sensation believe that enlightenment is achieved through experience. Total experience of all possibility. Outsiders may view them as hedonists, always throwing feasts and orgies and using their philosophy as an excuse for extravagance. But this actually isn't what they're about. They're more akin to explorers. They're equally as interested in experiencing great pain as great pleasure. To make their vast ambitions for personally experiencing everything the multiverse has to offer feasible, they keep a library of sense stones, visceral memories stored in stones. Touch one, and you have the complete experience of whatever memory is inside. Maybe it's of paralyzing, mind-shattering fear the moment someone glimpsed an elder god. Or of perfect ataraxia. Or of devastating heartbreak. Being defined by their belief in the power of the senses, they very much live in the now. And having such a vast store of experience, they are often accepting of others. Hedonism or Epicureanism might align with this group more than some of the others, but they aren't really about decreasing suffering and increasing pleasure. Mostly, they represent empiricism. They're mostly true neutral or chaotic neutral. Transcendent Order The Transcendent Order believe in the purity of instinct. They stress the importance of knowing your true place in the universe and acting in harmony with all things. They're monks who train their minds and bodies to be in tune with the world. In terms of storytelling, the Transcendent Order believes that there is a canonical path for your life, a true path. Follow the way. They're pretty directly Taoists. They cherish simplicity and spontaneity. Action without intention, or Wu Wei, as the Taoists call it. One of the Taoist beliefs accurately describes the cosmic principle that I haven't mentioned. It's called the Unity of Rings. It states that things are cyclical and circular. Everything comes back around to where it started. Extremes meet. They are also very similar to Zen Buddhism, which is similar to Taoism. The Transcendent Order believe that you achieve higher understanding of the universe as you achieve higher understanding of yourself. Alignment-wise, they're really just exactly true neutral, as Taoism has strong elements of non-intervention. But some might be neutral good. Chaositex. The Chaositex believe that there is nothing but chaos to the universe. Things can't make sense. And any sense you think they do make is an illusion. A product of mere probability, and if you keep observing that thing, you'll find that it has no reliable pattern after all. So chaos is the only universal truth. Or, that truth is revealed through chaos. The natural order is disorder. When my D&D group met a representative of the Chaositex, he was so erratic that he couldn't maintain a single personality. 
He saw through the illusions of order in the universe to such a degree that he actually knew that our characters weren't real and were being controlled by us, the players. Chaos attacks know they exist in a fictional game world, or at least some of them do, sometimes. All of the other factions think the Chaos attacks are absolutely crazy. Just look at how they spell their faction's name. As chaotic as they are, there really is no real-life philosophy you can satisfyingly attribute to them. Radical skepticism is close, as in the denial of the possibility of knowledge. Anti-realism or metaphysical nihilism or absurdism provide a loose fit as well. Obviously, they're chaotic neutral. Or even chaotic stupid. Of course, this isn't an exhaustive list of all the philosophies that exist in the world. It's just the philosophies that for whatever reason the people who made the Planescape setting created and thought would be fun to throw in there for players to be able to side with. And also, not every possible ounce of creativity was used to come up with these philosophies, as there are a few that are quite similar to each other, such as the Free League and the Revolutionary League. But enough creativity was put into this to make it interesting. Maybe one of these philosophies spoke to you. Maybe a few of them did. Throughout my life, I found myself flitting back and forth between nearly all of these philosophies and more, even if only for moments at a time, never able to resolutely stand by any of them. This uncertainty, this cosmological choice paralysis, has led me in recent years to come to the somewhat anticlimactic conclusion that some part of all of these philosophies is correct, that there is truth in all things. Perhaps some future version of humanity will piece together the puzzle of the universe and form a coherent and all-encompassing philosophy, one that says, and logically conveys, that life is meaningless, and the most meaningful thing possible, all at once. Free will does and does not exist. Everything is real, and it's all in your head. All things are one, but still distinct. You are God, and so is everything else. Order and chaos are one and the same. Being one of, or the only, truly, true, neutral thing in existence, perhaps this is what the Lady of Pain understands, and she's just waiting for the rest of the universe to figure it out. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, or if you enjoyed any of my other videos, then it would be really helpful if you could show this to a friend. Just one is fine. And if you want to help out more than that, consider subscribing. Anyway, I hope you found this video interesting, and have a great day. I'll see you next time.